and welcome to Kelly Appy, a self-help podcast. Well, welcome to season four. Yeah, I'm excited to start the season off with my newfound friend, Trisha Perido. Now, Trisha is a nationally certified life coach and an international master addiction specialist. Last season, I had an in-depth conversation with Trisha about understanding addictions. Now, she is not only an expert in the field of addiction, but also a really fun person to talk to, I found out. Last week, while we were chatting, I brought up the plight of the relapser. You know, I was just kind of interested to get her take on it. So I asked her why she thought that people relapsed. And she immediately replied, post-acute withdrawal syndrome. Wow. I had never heard of this before, so I dove into it deep with her, and as she was explaining to me the syndrome, I I knew that this just had to be the topic for my show, and Trisha is the perfect person to bring it to light. I think this is really going to help the addict out there, especially the chronic relapser. I know this is going to be a really powerful conversation, so let's get to it. Please welcome to the show, Trisha. All right. Welcome, Trisha. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited that you blocked out this time to talk with us today about post-alcohol withdrawal syndrome. I, I mean, when we were talking last week, I, I I had never heard of this before. And when you said it, you said it just like I was like, why, why do you think people relapse? You're like, ah, post-alcohol withdrawal syndrome. I'm like, what? What is this? Like post-acute. post-acute. And, and I'll... And I, I, Post-acute withdrawal syndrome. Post-acute. See, that's why that's why I have you here. Okay. But post-acute, because it can be for other things other than alcohol, can it? Absolutely. I gotcha. I gotcha. So so just so everybody can understand, can you explain to the listener what is post-acute withdrawal syndrome? Okay, I'll start with my favorite way to describe this. Post-acute withdrawal syndrome is a cycle that we experience again post acute withdrawal um play on words there but it it, so it's a cycle that we experience in in seven to ten day increments and what this can look like feel like for all the women and men who completely understand women um, can look and feel quite a bit like pms on steroids oh great (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, and, 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 and the tricky part about it, and and I'll explain it better, but the tricky part about it is it can, it, it, you know, that seven to 10 day cycle, it can come and, and last for just a day, or it could come and last for just as long that seven to 10 day period. And then, you know, you can take out seven to 10 day break and then it can come back again. So the length, of time that it sticks around also varies. Again, it could be anywhere from one to 10 days and we could have, you know, a seven to 10 day break. And, and sometimes we won't notice it at all. We could go two, three months and not notice any, any truly railing signs or symptoms. Um, And and that can also make it very tricky and very derailing. And it's why most people that do learn about it still get complacent with tracking it because they'll think that they're one of the ones that got lucky and it was really short lived and and it didn't hang around for the full two years. Um, And and, and I say two years because it's the safest bet. There's, you know, I I did, I researched 13 different um, what, wow, drawn a blank this morning, 13 different scholarly articles. So peer reviewed documents on post acute withdrawal, because you're not going to find a whole lot. You're going to find a lot of people like myself in the industry reporting what they learned about it. Um, but, you know, there's not a lot of journal articles out there about it. Um, but, but you can find scholarly articles if you know how to search for those. Anyway, these symptoms can can very much be spread out. So if we don't make it an important piece of our recovery, and I can tell you from from chronologically watching my own journey, as well as studying all of my clients from start to, you know, as long as I could, um, everyone that I was able to identify, I'm always able to tie it back to um, post-acute withdrawal in one way, shape or form another. 
because, you know, so it's, it's that, that reason we hear, I can get three months. I've never gotten past six months. Mm -hmm. I always seem to have a slip around nine months. Um, I have a client that, that has that struggles getting past 18 months. And you, if you can think about that, 18 months is a long time yeah. to be mindful and paying attention to, oh my gosh, is this hormonal or is this post-acute withdrawal? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I had, I had a girl I was working with. She had a lot of things going on. She had, she was a drug addict getting off of drugs. She was a alcoholic recovering from alcohol and she, it was, it was cyclical. She could, she could, she could name. She's like, okay, you know, every 30 days right before I'm going to get this intense need to just relapse. And, and there was nothing she could do. She basically knew it was coming. And when it came, it, it hit her hard. Like she was like in the house. She couldn't get out, of, leave the house, super depressed and now looking back at what, after what you're telling me, it totally sounds like this was what was going on because she was blaming it on her period, you know, because you know, I'm sure that might play into it. I don't know, but. Uh, well, I mean, if we look at what the, what the true symptomology is, right. And, and, and it varies. And, and I'll touch on briefly what the different substance of use could expect more of, but the general culmination of these the post-acute withdrawal symptoms are irritability, agitation, hostility, depression, anxiety, Uh mood swings, Uh low energy and fatigue, sleep disruption to include insomnia, limited ability to focus or think clearly, a lack of libido, um, and an inexplicable chronic pain. That's just some of them. Again, you add in any, any other, you know, things that might be normal symptoms for you. I, I had a lot of hangover type feelings, um, and, and, you know, would just wake up feeling like I've just hit like the hardest pothole ever. And, or like, I would wake up and feel like I just got hit by a Mack truck, like just and, and I guess we could put that into that inexplicable chronic pain. Um, but that's, you know, a, a general overview. And, you know, it, it does, again, depend on the drug of choice, how long, how frequently, how much of the substances the, per- the person was using, were, were there already any co-occurring physical or mental health conditions, and, you know, what level of support or, uh, or substance abuse, you know, treatment, um, ha- has a person engaged in and, and what did those professionals help them see and understand about them as a unique individual being about their cycles. Um, because, you know, everybody, like I said, you know, may or may not experience it differently. And, and so, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that we can do, but I'll tell you what your friend was going through. She, she was awesome. She got, she didn't have a name for it. She didn't have post-acute withdrawal to call it, but she knew every 30 days, I'm going to feel like this. And I just know it's coming, which is great. Mentally and emotionally prepared for it. Sit on your hands, lean in, go for the ride. Mm. You know, that's, that's the best thing I can say. I, my, my tactic was to, you know, walk down the stairs in the morning if, if that's when it was, or if it hit me midday, was just to go go down and announce to my spouse and, and the one child that was still living at home um, when I was going through this process and just, you know, announce like, hey, it's a post-acute withdrawal day. And I had, you know, taken the time to explain to them what the symptoms were, you know, post-acute withdrawal day. So if anything comes out of my mouth and it doesn't sound right, it sounds, you know, <laughs> mean and nasty. I'm trying to keep it real clean. Um, if it sounds real mean and nasty, you know, like I, I don't mean it, please, you know, I'm going to try real hard to keep to myself today, but this is why, because saying it out loud helped me, Mm -hmm. but it also helped me invite them into my space so that we didn't have a disconnect, Mm -hmm. you know? So there's, there's a lot of skill sets and tactics that I teach for people to, you know, learn how to sit in and move through it. But but you know, you've got to, you've got to at least be able to own it. So when I say I can usually tie it to, you know, relapse and what causes 
I would say over 95% of all relapses because, you know, something bad happens and you get the, you know, the efforts um, or, or, you know, um, you, you know, I don't know, you lose your job. Somebody, somebody passes away unexpectedly, you know, um, or you just have a bad day, Trisha, just, you know, yeah, whatever you the excuse just have a bad day. You're just stressed out. And you're like, I'm just going to stop at the liquor store on the way home, mm-hmm. you know? And, and it's just that, that limbic system taken back over of just giving you that knee jerk reactive response of a condition, an old conditioned way of being, which is to rely on something outside of ourselves, insert alcohol, whatever, to bring us peace, joy, comfort, and relief. And and so we go directly to that external locus of control position and and then we got to start over, right? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the really the best way when, when like, so the chronic relapser, when they, when these feelings come, sometimes it does just help to know, oh, I've got this post-acute withdrawal syndrome. It's hormonal. It's it, my body's out of balance. Everything's out of balance. It will pass. And I just have to know this is going to be, it's, today's going to suck. I'm going to get through today, but I'm not going to do my drug of choice today to solve this problem. And eventually by doing that, you can help break the cycle. Is that how that works, Tricia? Am I understanding that? You know, it's not that you break the cycle. I mean, you break the cycle because you've given yourself a reason to move through it. Mm -hmm. Um, So yes, you break the relapse cycle. Sorry, I I was thinking break the post-acute withdrawal cycle. It it just will get fewer and farther between and less severe over time. And generally, you know, by the time you've gotten two years, it's it's, it's gone, Um, is, is generally, you know, what we say. But yes, the more times that you can sit in and move through those uncomfortable periods and, and you can chalk it up to being post-acute withdrawal, the more you're going to condition yourself to realizing that you do have the capacity to make it through those high levels of craving that, you know, deep seated calling that, you know, that whatever that is that pulls you back in every time whether it's mindless, you know, like I just, I just decided, you know, I just decided I was going to drink and, and, you know, that mindless knee jerk reactivity that is, is, is not thought through. Yes. You can break that cycle. And what we have to do is condition new ways of being. So if that is, you know what, I had to push pause on, on, on everything right now, because I'm extremely uncomfortable on emotional level because you know, acute withdrawal is more physical, right? It's super physically uncomfortable. Post-acute withdrawal can can feel physically uncomfortable, but it's more emotional in nature. And so, and it, there's reasons for that. But go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you, you know, it's it, it's it's a physiological, you know, adaptation, right? So you know, it's it's you. Our bodies are used to an influx of drugs to regulate our functioning like digestion or hormones. So the withdrawal symptoms um, that, that we may, you know, find are, you know, might be nausea, stomach cramps and diarrhea. Uh, but sometimes, you know, they can take, they can take a while to return to normal, right? So if we have stress, you know, if, if our normal response to that is taking a drug, you know, that, str- that, that need to release the stress is going to have to have some place to go. Right. And, and so it, it, those stressors can prolong um, these withdrawal symptoms uh, because, because we're not giving it what it's used to conditioned. So, you know, so part of the re- rehabilitation is to, is to retain behaviors and responses to drugs and alcohol. So recovering addicts might, you know, might really be missing that process or behavioral piece to it, right? The, the ritualistic pieces. And, and so we have to, we have to avoid that, that, that need to return, 
right? So there's there's a lot of different things to look at on a on a physiological and and a, and a homeostatic, you know, adjustment perspective, um, as well as psychologically. So we have to know, you know, like what might my post acute withdrawal symptoms look like if I was, you know, a marijuana user, if I, you know, was you know, using cocaine or amphetamines, right? Because I, cocaine, we're going to have impulse control issues. We're going to need to, to, to develop some skill sets with impulse control. Sitting on our hands and leaning in is only going to work for so long if we have that, you know, um, you know, deep impulsivity. Um, and, you know, with methamphetamines, we can, we can expect that that's even more exacerbated because of the, you know, the half-life and the length of time that that high sticks around and, and the opiate, opiate addicts, you know, it, it tends to stick around maybe even a little bit longer, but they, they, they generally will have more sleep disruption, more anxiety, more depression and, and a significant decrease in executive control functions, right? Um, benzodiazepines, they're, they're going to, you know, they're going to really struggle with the reemergence of their symptoms that, that actually led to them being prescribed that medication to begin with. I already mentioned anxiety, right? So, so we, it, it behooves you to, to sit with, you know, a professional that understands post-acute withdrawal that, that can really help you like identify what's ingrained in you. What is your conditioned way of being? even before you started adding chemical substance in and before you became dependent on it, because now we can go back to, you know, some of those areas in these, you know, early development, adolescence, young adulthood, where we can start to make tweaks of how we adopted that way of, of coping and how did it, how did it emerge into, but then there are some that came after, you know, the substance use began and, and, you know, insert traumatic events. Yeah. And, and so we have to learn how to package those up and put them on a shelf so that we can sit in and move through. But, you know, I think that the most important thing to know is that these cycles happen in about seven to 10 day in increments and they come and they go and they have varying, you know, gaps between and, and gaps or varying levels of se severity as far as the, you know, the symptoms and, and, and that, you know, it, it's really important that you focus on it for the first two years of recovery and you don't get complacent or complacent about it. So if you were, um, so I'm listening. So if I'm one of the listeners, I'm listening to this and, and, and what I'm hearing is fascinating. It absolutely is fascinating. And you say that, okay, sit on, lean in into it, sit on your hands. Is there some, some other stuff you can do other than, and, and like you said, go to therapy. Is there some other like tricks to get you through these times when you're really feeling it other than that? Or is there what, like things you tell your clients? Tons, tons of things. So I'll start with the safest place to belly up is an AA meeting, not a bar. Um, and you can add edit, delete, change, shift, morph that to fit your addiction. But mm -hmm. you know, AA, NA, OA. What, what, whatever 12 step recovery. Yeah. Right, right. Th those social support meetings are absolutely the safest place to belly up. Good. Because you're going to walk into a room of people that want to see you succeed, um, generally speaking, or hopefully, right? Um, and so there's that. Get in touch with a recovery nutrition specialist. I, I'm one. I'm happy to, to chat with anybody um, because the way that we eat in early recovery really makes a difference. Um, our, all of our organs, to include our skin, uh, need to heal. And, and we can, we can really manage this with the, with the way that we fuel our body. And we can actually decrease the post-acute withdrawal symptomology through our dietary practices, but we can also speed up the recovery process, um, through the way that we, you know, fuel our body and, and nourish ourselves. So, um, that's, you know, that's a big, that's a big thing. Um, <clears throat> anything that you can do to decrease stress or stressors in your life. So um, getting those distress tolerance skill sets um, are going to be huge. Emotion regulation skill sets, enormous. Um, there's a reason why it's in my first 12 weeks of, of working with anybody. We have to have that. You need impulse control. Um, you, you know, so, you know, you can look up 
skill sets and tactics. You can ask a therapist to give you tactics. You can, you know, I always say, look at, look at your own life and, and what is it that you need, right? Um, and, and really start to work on getting into that intuitive mindset so that you can function from an internal locus of control instead of being externally driven. Um, because it's all of that outside noise that really causes issue for addicts. I probably said a lot of things over your head. So distract yourself with something opposite. If you're feeling, you know, highly irritated, agitated, annoyed, frustrated, bothered, um, you know, maybe go watch a funny movie, um, do an art project, um, pick something recreational that will bring you joy. If you're feeling sad, lonely, you know, you know, something of despair, you know, grab onto a social something um, as hard as it may be. Uh, but grab, grab onto a social support. Um, again, insert AANA, OA, whatever it is. Um, know that Ben and Jerry's will never help the situation. Um, increasing your, your sugar is only going to exacerbate these, these episodes. Oh, that's interesting, Tricia, because, oh. you know, I've always heard, well, and this is recovering from alcohol. I always heard that, oh, well, you're taking out the sugar out of your system. So you're going to want to have sugar handy yep. to help with the craving. No, you're going to, no, you don't want to have sugar handy to help with the cravings. Oh. Um, um, <laughs> but um, so let's just, let's not promote cross addiction because um, I, I will tell you, I've been working in this, you know, in this arena for quite some time. And it's a main purpose of why I got <clears throat> certified as a food addiction coach, mm. because as well as a recovery fitness and nutrition coach, because so many addicts cross into one, one form of food addiction or another. And people tell me, Oh, I don't, I'm not a sweets person, but then they turn around and they list all the items that they're eating and it's bread, carbs, white rice, all things that convert to sugar in our body. So really we're not doing anything to decrease that sugar in our body. So now we're promoting, you know, this the sugar addiction, which I'm, I'm going to tell you what detoxing from sugar is worse than alcohol. It stinks. It's miserable. Anyway, <laughs> I've done both and it's miserable, but, but we're, we're really not doing by, by keeping hard candies. I, I was always mortified by the red punch we kept at the first facility I worked at. I'm like, this is insane. This is counter counterintuitive. Um, no natural sugars. Sure. But even the natural sugars you want to watch. So, you know, there's, you know, if you've got to have chocolate, you know, get the, you know, super dark, you know, you know, cocoa, like almost the raw chocolate, if you can, um, you know, as close to earth as possible. But, but I'll tell you sitting down and eating three tangerines or, or, you know, cuties or something or oranges is going to be not necessarily the greatest idea. So we need to, we need to look at how balanced is our diet, because if we're getting too little protein or too much protein, that's going to increase our sugar cravings. And you notice I said too, too much or too little, yeah. if we don't have that sweet spot. You know, it's going to increase our sugar cravings. Sometimes when we're craving things like ice cream, it's really our body telling us that we need calcium. So we'd probably be better off or better served having some broccoli. Um, and, uh, you know, really just those refined sugars are bad, but, you know, anytime we can stay to those lower in sugar content, cause I loved pineapple and pineapple. I, I love pineapple too. You can, you're not, right. it's, pine it, it's gotta be in moderation, man. Cause it's so oh. high in sugar. So you can have it. Yes. But like make yourself a fruit salad with just a few of the citruses and a lot of berries, right? Gotcha. The darker, the berry, the better it's the, the lower sugar content. Um, but, you know, again, there's, there's just a lot of tips and tricks that there's, there's things that you can do that are extremely healthy for you that will satiate that, that sugar craving with nothing but things filled with nutrients. I believe me, I love me some ice cream, but I have mastered the art of making protein smoothies that are the consistency of, of a soft serve ice cream and have the right amount of sweetness to take that away. And all I'm getting is vitamins, nutrients, protein, um, minerals, and healthy fat. Okay. And I'm here. Good. I'm hearing my next, my next Kelly Appy Trisha <laughs> episode. <laughs> Stay tuned, ladies. <laughs> Stay tuned. My, 
my listeners, because Trisha will be back season five talking about food. <laughs> we'll talk about food next. Sure. We'll talk about food and then and then we can go into, you know, some of the replacement things and, and or when is it appropriate to add in a replacement? I'm, I'm seeing a lot of that right now. A lot of people doing dry January um, and they're they're going, you know, and, and bless their heart. And I think it's great if you want to become sober conscious, but sometimes utilizing alcohol free beverages when, you, when you're trying to give up alcohol might be great for the moment, but how's that going to help you when you're in a period of post-acute withdrawal and that alcohol-free thing ain't cutting it? Like I can have a glass of wine, you know, um, we still need to be prepared for the same things. We can't just be relying on something outside of ourselves to bring us peace, joy, comfort, and relief. Even if it's not altering our brain, we've got to show up as organic beings. And, and so if we have to have that hand to mouth, why? Remember, I, I specialize in process and behavioral addiction as well. And so we're just cross addicting. We're just cross addicting. So why not learn how to live free from all of that? Now, are, are some people more susceptible? Like you talked about all the different, everything pretty much can have post-acute withdrawal symptoms. But does, is it, does that mean everybody's going to have it or? Yeah. Everybody may not have the same level of severity. Everybody may not have um, the the same. I don't know. I I didn't feel like mine were real frequent. Um, maybe in the first you know three months or so, but I didn't feel like mine were super frequent. But I was also very adamant about my dietary practices and 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 right. So everybody's a unique being, and I think the day that we all realize that recovery, you know, is is <laughs> is not. I don't know, one size fits all. Um, and that, you know, no two people are the, exactly the same. Like knowing that it's a, a thing that happens and taking the time to observe it and how it affects you, the individual unique amoeba that you are, is, is going to behoove you the best. Because there are some people that, there are some people that can, you know, give up their substance of choice and not cross addict. There are some people that can give up their substance of choice, but still maintain alcohol in their life responsibly because it's just not their thing. Um, I mean, there's no danger in the world that I'd ever become an opiate addict. It triggers too many of my other issues. It gives me headaches and contest constipates me, which then triggers my body dysmorphia and, <laughs> you know, yeah. then, then, then brings up eating disorders. So, you know, there's just no chance for me. So I, I, I mean, I, I don't even use them anyway. You know, even if I have significant pain because I just, they just don't serve me, but you know, so we all have to know what is it for us. And, and, and that's why I'm just so passionate about helping one person at a time. Yeah. It, it really is kind of an individual, like, yeah, we, we do, we, we, there's the similarity in the symptoms, but everybody deals with them a different way, right? Everybody needs detoxification and stabilization. Well, okay. Not even everybody needs detox to the level of needing to go to detox, yeah. but yeah. we all need detox. We all need stabilization period, right? We are all need to get back to a baseline and some level of homeostasis. Um, but how we need to do that is different even, even then, but there, and there is purpose for every level of standardized treatment. There is value and validity in all of those things for who need it. Mm -hmm. And sure, that may be a significant population, but I'm here to say there's so many not so normal phases of addiction that don't. And, you know, so where do you go? That's awesome. Well, listen, believe it or not, we are at the, we are at the end of the podcast. No, but, but it's not over yet. As I do with all my episodes, I like to let my guest end with a, a, a message of hope for the person out there who's suffering, let's say in this particular case, the relapser who's suffering and feeling hopeless right now. What's your message of hope for that person today, Tricia? The quote I chose today comes from, and, and maybe you, you know, you meant for this to be for you, but I, I really liked it, but um, comes from the New York Times bestselling author, Ellen Hopkins, from her book, Traffic, she writes, a chat with the Grim Reaper should be enough to scare away any thought of relapse. Wish it were that easy, but not even days conversing with death can disintegrate the claws of addiction. Mm -hmm. That's true. 
Yes, that is that is a great quote from the book Traffic. Have you read that book, by the way? Not in its entirety, no. I got I got I got to check it out because after I read that, I was like, "Ooh, right, this looks, right." This looks interesting. I, yeah. Well, Tricia, thanks so much again for for coming out today. Uh, I I know you're going to help a lot of people with this podcast, and that's why we do it. We both have a passion for helping those who are suffering, especially the addicts and the alcoholics out there. If you want more of Trisha, though, you don't, you don't have to end it here. There's lots of Trisha to go around. Trisha, what are you working on right now? How can people uh, get more of Trisha Peridot? Well, I'm working on a lot of things, but I'm just going to say, you know, go to Turning Leaves Recovery. That's T-U-R-N-I-N-G-L-E-A-V-E-S recovery.com. Click on contact us. Just shoot me a note there. It's going to come directly to my inbox and we'll figure out what's going to be the best way for us to chat. We can have a meet and greet, a collaboration, whatever it is, consultation. Um, So you can just find me there on my website. It's probably the quickest and easiest. Well, definitely check out Trisha's website, turningleavesrecovery.com. And She's a wonderful lady. I know you'll you'll get a lot out of talking with her. So uh, that is the end of our podcast today. Thank you so much for turning into Kelly Appy today. Season four is off to a strong start. We have a whole season full of more exciting guests covering a range of topics that you're not going to want to miss. So if you enjoyed this podcast, subscribe. We'll be doing this for a half an hour each week. And if you'd like more positive messages, check out YouTube, my, my YouTube blog, Monday Messages. Oh, and, and I'm also going to be on Trisha's Thursday. What is it? What is it? Um... Mastering the Drop, A Real View of Recovery. It's on Wednesdays um, at 12 noon Pacific Standard. Yes. And we're going to be doing it next week, I believe. Is it next week already? Yeah. Yeah. It'll be fun. I can't wait. I'm super excited about it. (laughs) Well, so that ends it for now until we see you again next week. Have a great week and we'll see you next week for another edition of Kelly Yappy. Bye. Bye.